Welcome to Let's Fix It Right. In this video I'll show you how to easily and efficiently test and replace a bad ground fault circuit interrupter outlet which is more commonly known and abbreviated as a GFCI outlet. To ensure you understand what I'm doing I'll also cover some GFCI basics to include their purpose, code requirements, and wiring for single and daisy chain GFCI outlet circuits. In episode 57, I provide step-by-step -step instructions showing you how to test the GFCI outlets in your home for safety and real estate inspection purposes. It's very important that you know how to perform these procedures because they are included within most home inspections in today's hot real estate markets. Within episode 57, I cover the actual real-world GFCI inspection results in these reports in support of selling these two homes in our neighborhood. In this video, episode 56, we will be installing the Leviton 20 amp GFCI outlet shown in all three pictures. And it's also shown in its original box in this photo. If you're interested in purchasing a proven Leviton GFCI outlet with a 20 or 15 amp specification, go to the description below and select show more. The installation approaches and techniques that I use are common to most GFCI outlets on the market today. So this video should be valuable to you regardless of what make of GFC outlet you are installing. Most importantly, this episode will save you the cost of hiring an expensive electrician to perform this simple job. Nevertheless, if you are uncomfortable with doing some basic electrical work, I recommend that you do hire an electrician. As stated here in the box, the purpose of a GFCI outlet is to protect you against electrical shocks and injuries, while regular outlets will not. A GFCI outlet senses a change in electrical current flow, which is commonly known as a ground fault, and instantaneously shuts off the flow of electricity in and from the outlet. For example, if you drop a hair dryer into a water-filled sink with your hand on it, the GFC outlet will shut down the power immediately, thereby preventing you from being seriously shocked or even killed. Most county and municipality building codes require GFCI outlets in living areas such as above countertops, near bathroom sinks, kitchen sinks, and wet bars. They are also frequently required for garage outlets and exterior outlets. In addition, at least one GFC outlet is normally required for a basement. Frequently, electricians satisfy these requirements by daisy chaining regular outlets attached to a GFCI outlet. As shown in the schematic here, outlet A on the left is the GFCI outlet and outlets B and C are regular outlets. Power from the service panel comes into outlet A on its upper line side, then protected power leaves outlet A's lower load connection en route to the line side of outlet B and so on to outlet C. This arrangement with only one actual GFCI outlet provides GFCI protection to outlets A, B, and C. In other words, if a ground fault occurs in outlets B or C, outlet A will kick off and cut power to outlets B and C as well. In regards to daisy chains, an electrician daisy chained our master bathroom vanity GFCI outlet to our front porch outlet to satisfy the GFCI protection requirement for our outside front porch. I first noticed this when my wife's hair dryer kicked off the power in our bathroom vanity GFCI outlet, which caused our Christmas decorations powered by the front porch outlet to go out also. This electrician also daisy chained our kitchen GFCI outlet to our outside patio outlet. It's important to note that GFCI daisy chains are not always required. In this case, power comes into the line side of this GFCI outlet and there are no connections from its lower load side to a follow-on daisy chain of regular outlets. In other words, this is a single GFCI outlet. These photos show the line and load connections on an actual GFCI outlet, where the line connections are on the top of the outlet and the load connections are on the bottom of the outlet. Notice that the hot black wires connect to the brass screws on the right side of the outlet and the white wires connect to the silver screws on the left side of the outlet. However, please note that some GFCI outlet manufacturers position the load side on the top and the line connections on the bottom. So it's very important for you to double check the back side of your outlet to ensure your connections are correct. By code, you can also protect an entire GFCI circuit without using a GFCI daisy chain by originating and protecting the circuit with a GFCI circuit breaker similar to these. 
On the left is a new GFCI circuit breaker just out of the box, and on the right is one installed on my circuit breaker panel, which powers an external circuit in my backyard. This external GFCI circuit powers and protects the outside circuit for my wife's water fountain and our patio ceiling fans and lights. I'm out in my unfinished garage where I'll show you how to test a GFCI outlet. And I press the test button to trip the internal GFCI circuit breaker to make the voltage go to zero. If you reset this by pressing the red button, the voltage comes back on and you heard a snap or a pop sound. In addition, the green light came on over here. However, please note that older GFCI outlets do not have green lights. As you can see, I have 123 volts, which is actually better than 120 volts for a household. Lastly, please note if a GFCI outlet will not go to zero volts by pressing the black test button or return to 120 volts by pressing the red reset button, it is considered a defective outlet. At this time, I'll show you how I replace my old defective GFCI outlet. As I mentioned, this old outlet does not have a green light. The test procedure I just showed you would not work and the voltage in the outlet was always zero. In addition, electricians recommend changing GFCI outlets every 10 years and testing them once a month. Our house is 25 years old, and I'm surprised that this outlet in a hot and humid garage environment has taken this long to fail. As you can see, this outlet has taken a beating in our unfinished garage over the years. In my case, I needed the following tools and equipment to replace this outlet. Straight blade screwdriver, Phillips screwdriver, wire strippers, wire cutters, long nose pliers, regular pliers, multimeter or a voltage tester and an electric drill with a Phillips screw bit. If you need any of these tools, I've included some links to tools similar to these. Go to the description below and select show more. For safety purposes, I turned off the breaker to make the voltage go to zero and removed the outlet cover with a straight blade screwdriver. Next, I removed the outlet's Phillips screws with my electric drill and a Phillips head screw bit. Let's pull this out and see what we have. As you can see, we only have one set of wires and a ground wire coming into the outlet. So in other words, we have the very easy non-daisy chain installation that I mentioned previously. Consequently, we will only be connecting the black and white wires to the line side of the outlet. It's very important for you to note if you have a daisy chain configuration, you also connect the existing black and white load wires from the old outlet to the load side of the new outlet. In this case, I'll cut the ground wire first and attach it to our new outlet. We'll then orient the wire loop in a clockwise direction so it corresponds to the clockwise tightening of the ground wire screw. Next, we'll tighten this loop with our pliers and tighten the screw with a Phillips screwdriver. Next, we'll cut the white and black wires, strip approximately one half of an inch of covering from the white wire, and unscrew the white wire lug receptacle, which is the silver screw. It's important to ensure that we do not have any copper exposed and then tighten the connection. Next, we'll install the black wire, which is the hot wire. Using the same approach, I'll strip one half of an inch of covering from it and unscrew its brass lug receptacle. Once again, we'll ensure that we do not have any copper exposed and then tighten the connection. Next, push the entire outlet assembly and the wires back into the outlet box. With several wires, you may have to push this assembly hard. While doing this, center the outlet in the box and screw it in place. Center the box. Yeah. 
Lastly, tighten these threads by hand to ensure you don't strip the threads in the receptacle. In this case, we're good to go. Prior to installing the cover, I went through the test procedures that I showed you previously with the test and reset buttons to ensure they work properly and the outlet provides at least 120 volts. Set my voltage meter, reset the circuit breaker in the basement to on, and the voltage registered to zero as shown here. Press the red reset button and heard her pop and the voltage jumped to 124 volts. Continuing with the procedure, I pressed the black test button and the voltage dropped to zero as it should. Lastly, I pushed the red reset button again, heard a pop, and the voltage jumped to 124 volts, demonstrating that this is a properly functioning GFCI outlet. Two of our good neighbor friends recently had to undergo detailed home inspections in conjunction with selling their houses. Looking for all potential electrical problems, the inspection teams checked all of the GFCI outlets in both homes to ensure they passed the test that I just showed you. Consequently, I think it's very important that you understand how to perform this test and change a faulty GFCI outlet. As I mentioned before, this outlet's been out here for 25 years, so I'm going to install a new cover. Lastly, we'll check our new outlet by plugging in my wife's central vacuum and running it. As you can see, the outlet and the vacuum work perfectly. This concludes this episode where I showed you how to easily and efficiently test and replace a bad GFCI outlet and covered some key GFCI basics to include their purpose, code requirements, and wiring for single and daisy chain GFCI outlet circuits. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel and select the YouTube bell so YouTube will notify you of all my new projects immediately after I publish them. At this time I'm moving on to my next project. You're more than welcome to follow. In addition, if you have a great project that you want to post on my YouTube channel, email me some pictures and a brief description of it. If it qualifies for the Let's Fix It Right standards to help others, I'll interview you over the phone as a guest do-it-yourselfer, produce a high-quality video, and post it on my Let's Fix It Right channel. For the year following this posting, I'll share 50% of the potential YouTube benefits with you. If you have any subject matter requests or recommendations, please contact me. With all of this said, I recommend that you subscribe to my channel follow my projects, and save a bundle of money doing it.